Hello there, Thrill Seekers. I was asked if I had ever done a video on the 10 ox herding pictures. And the answer is uh, no. But last year, I had this idea to do a video on the 10 ox herding pictures. And it was a very elaborate scheme that I was going to redraw the ox herding pictures, like my own versions. And then after the video was over, I was going to put those uh, drawings up on eBay and see if anybody would bid on them and, and buy them, and, like make a little extra money for myself or something. Anyway, uh, I never did that. By the way, would anybody out there buy if I drew ox herding pictures or something and put them on eBay? Would you buy them? Just curious. Leave a leave a, uh, a comment or, or uh, send me an email if you would. So uh, the 10 ox herding pictures are one of the things that if you're going to go around at cocktail parties or wherever you go and tell people that you're into Buddhism and you're, you're I'm into Zen, you, you better know what the 10 ox herding pictures are. Now, having said that, it's mostly a Rinzai thing. And, you know, some of my best friends are Rinzai. So, you know, I got nothing against Rinzai. So that means I haven't studied the 10 ox herding pictures extensively. They weren't, they weren't part of my uh, sort of training in Buddhism. The only place where I learned about the 10 ox herding pictures was in my initial that class that I took uh, about Zen Buddhism. I've told this story many times that the way I got into Zen was taking a class at Kent State University about Zen Buddhism. And in that class, the, the teacher, Tim McCarthy, tried to present both the Rinzai and the Soto perspectives and the sort of general things you ought to know if you're going to tell people at cocktail parties that you're into Zen about Zen and the ox herding pictures were part of that. And after that, I never really bothered with the ox herding pictures. But I'm going to tell you what they are. And most of the information I am going to give you comes from this book, Manual of Zen Buddhism by D.T. Suzuki. This is one of those old school Zen books. Let's see what the copyright date is on it. <laughs> there is none. It's so old, they didn't have copyrights then. Now, I don't know why they eliminated the copyright date. Maybe because they they didn't want people to know this is a reprint. Okay, originally published in 1934, so it does say that. Uh, so, 1934. So this is really early in Zen coming to the West in the history of it. And, and I kind of like uh, these books. I have a soft spot for books like this because when I first started studying Zen, really just about the only things you could get were these old, old books. You know, the ones published between the 30s and the 50s when there was sort of a, an academic boom in, in, you know, the intelligentsia studying Zen and then sort of went, you know, underground for a while and nobody cared and then there was the swinging 60s. And most of the swinging 60s Zen stuff is not very good. So I tended to prefer this old stuff, which I still kind of enjoy. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about the, the Oxfording pictures. Uh, according to D.T. Suzuki, and he's probably a very reliable source on this, they were the production of a Sung Dynasty Zen master named Kakuan Shien, which is how you'd pronounce it in Japanese, or uh, Kuoan Shiyuan, which is approximating the Chinese pronunciation of it, and he was a Rinzai school teacher. And then the poems that, or the uh, little commentaries, are from a later period in the 1500s uh, by Pu Ming. And according to Suzuki, he doesn't know who Pu Ming was or, or anything, uh, anything about him. But the pictures are very famous and they've been reproduced a lot and there are actually several versions of the 10 ox herding pictures so the ones I'm going to give you are kind of the most common ones you'd encounter in Japan and the ones scholars usually comment on but there's other versions in which different things happen so let me just read you what happens and I'll show you the pictures as they happen and maybe make a little comments uh, as we go along we'll see here we go picture number one searching for the ox the beast has never gone astray, and what is the use of searching for him? Kind of standard Zen stuff, you know. Uh, what is the use for searching for reality? Dogen actually says the, this at the beginning of Fukan Zazengi about how we've never gone astray, so why are we wandering about in dusty lands looking for the thing we never lost? The reason why the ox herd uh, 
ox herder, I guess I would probably be more inclined to say, but the guy who's herding the ox. The reason why the ox herd is not on intimate terms with him, the ox, is because the ox herd himself has violated his own inmost nature. The beast is lost, for the ox herd has himself been led out of the way through his deluding senses. So the ox is obviously a symbol for enlightenment. His home is receding farther away from him, and byways and crossways are ever confused. Desire for gain and fear of loss burn like fire. Ideas of right and wrong shoot up like a phalanx. What is a phalanx? I'll have to look that up. And then there's a poem, which of course doesn't rhyme. Alone in the wilderness, lost in the jungle, the boy is searching and searching. The swelling waters, the faraway mountains, and the unending path. Exhausted in despair, he knows not where to go. He only hears the evening cicadas singing in the maple woods. Okay. And so picture number two, seeing the traces. By the aid of the sutras and by inquiring into the doctrines, he has come to understand something. He has found the traces. So this is what happens when you first start learning and reading about Buddhism or watching YouTube videos about it. He now knows that vessels, however varied, are all of gold, so everybody is enlightened. And that the objective world is a reflection of the self, and self is in a capital S here. Yet he is unable to distinguish what is good from what is not. His mind is still confused as to truth and falsehood. As he has not yet entered the gate, he is provisionally said to have noticed the traces. And the poem goes, By the stream and under the trees, scattered are the traces of the lost. The sweet-scented grasses are growing thick. Did he find the way? However remote over the hills and far away the beast may wander, his nose reaches the heavens and none can conceal it. Picture number three, seeing the ox. The boy finds the way by the sound he hears. He sees thereby into the origin of things, and all his senses are in harmonious order. In all his activities it is magnificently present. It is like the salt in water and the glue in color. The glue in color kind of confused me, but maybe it, when you're making paint there's glue mixed in with the color, I'm guessing. And in parentheses it says, it is there though not distinguishable as an individual entity. When the eye is properly directed, he will find that it is no other than himself. And the poem goes, On a yonder branch perches a nightingale cheerfully singing. The sun is warm and a soothing breeze blows. On the bank the willows are green. The ox is there all by himself. Nowhere is he to hide himself. And picture number four, catching the ox. Long lost in the wilderness, the boy has at last found the ox and his hands are on him. But owing to the overwhelming pressure of the outside world, the ox is hard to keep under control. So this is what, you know, when you've had your, your maybe your first moment of awakening, but you're finding that the world is kind of creeping back up on you. He constantly longs for the old, sweet-scented field. The wild nature is still unruly and altogether refuses to be broken. If the oxherd wishes to see the ox completely in harmony with himself, he has surely to use the whip freely. Which sounds a little violent, but I think that is about discipline. So you, you have to be disciplined. You can't just have your grand enlightenment experience and not expect to, to try to deal with a disciplined life. And the poem goes, With the energy of his whole being, the boy has at last taken hold of the ox. But how wild his will, how ungovernable his power. At times he struts up a plateau, when lo, he is lost again in a misty, unpenetrable mountain pass. Say it again, brother. That's how it feels. You kind of feel like, okay, I got this thing, and I understand it, and it's it's really powerful, but then I lose it all the time. So that's, that's a, a real thing. So let's keep going. Number five, herding the ox. When a thought moves, another follows, and then another. An endless train of thoughts is thus awakened. Through enlightenment, all this turns into truth, but falsehood asserts itself when confusion prevails. Things oppress us not because of an objective world, but because of a self-deceiving mind. Do not let the nose string loose, I guess on the, on the ox, the strings through his nose. Hold it tight and allow no vacillation, and the poem goes. The boy is not to separate himself with his whip and tether lest the animal should wander away into a world of defilements. When the ox is properly tended to, he will grow pure and docile. Without a chain, nothing binding, he will by himself follow the ox herd. 
Okay, the ox will follow the ox herd. That's just number five. We're just in the middle. And now here's picture number six. Coming home on the ox's back. The struggle is over. The man is no more concerned with gain and loss. He hums a rustic tune of the woodman. He sings simple songs of the village boy. Saddling himself on the ox's back, his eyes are fixed on things not of the earth. Earthy. I'm not sure what that means, but let's keep going. Even if he is called, he will not turn his head. However enticed, he will no more be kept aback. So things not of the earth, earthy. Uh, I'm not sure what they're getting at there. I, I think maybe both things not of the earth, the sort of spiritual side and this sort of earthly side are mixed together. In Nishijima Roshi's terms, idealistic and materialistic. So idealistic would be things not of the earth and materialistic would be earthy. So both are in balance. And here's the poem. Riding on the animal, he leisurely wends his way home. Enveloped in the evening mist, how tunefully the flute vanishes away. Well, I don't get that one. Singing a ditty, beating time, his heart is filled with a joy indescribable that he is now one of those who know. Need it be told? Okay. And here's picture number seven. The ox forgotten, leaving man alone. The dharmas are one and the ox is symbolic. Okay, we knew that. When you know that what you need is not the snare or set net, but the hare or fish. So you don't need the thing that caught you, the, the rabbit or the fish, but you need the actual rabbit or the fish. So getting going past the philosophies and things that got you there and the practices and just being the thing. It is like gold separated from the dross. It is like the moon rising out of the clouds. The one ray of light, serene and penetrating, shines even before the days of creation. Mm, I like that one. And here's the poem. Riding on the animal, he is at last back in his home, where, lo, the ox is no more, the man alone sits serenely. Though the red sun is high up in the sky, he is still quietly dreaming. Under a straw-thatched roof, are his whip and rope idly lying, so he doesn't need them anymore. And picture number eight, the ox and the man both gone out of sight. All confusion is set aside and serenity alone prevails. Even the idea of holiness does not obtain. He does not linger about where the Buddha is and as to where there is no Buddha, he speedily passes by. <laughs> Ziggy speedily passing by. When there exists no form of dualism, even a thousand-eyed one fails to detect a loophole. That's a weird sentence. A holiness before which birds offer flowers is but a farce. So, yeah, he's gone beyond everything sacred and profane, and he gets it all. So the poem goes, All is empty, the whip, the rope, the man, and the ox. Who can ever survey the vastness of heaven? Over the furnace burning ablaze, not a flake of snow can fall. When this state of things obtains, manifest is the spirit of the ancient master. Okay, nice one. And number nine, returning to the origin, back to the source. From the very beginning, pure and immaculate, the man has never been affected by defilement. He watches the growth of things while himself abiding in the immovable serenity of non-assertion. He does not identify himself with the Maya-like transformations that are going on about him. So it's interesting that the concept of Maya comes in, because I usually think of that as a, a concept from Hinduism. Maya is illusion, so this world is Maya, the illusion, God's, God's illusion. Uh, that's usually how it's, I think, explained in the uh, Hindu way of explaining things. Let's see, Maya like a transformation. Uh, nor has he any use of himself, which is artificiality. So he knows even himself is an artificial construct. The waters are blue, the mountains are green. Sitting alone, he observes things undergoing changes. And the poem goes, to return to the origin, to be back at the source, already a false step this. Hmm. Far better it is to stay at home, blind and deaf, without much ado. Sitting in the hut, he takes no cognizance of things outside. Behold the streams flowing, whither nobody knows, and the flowers vividly red, for whom are they? I like the old-fashioned, old-timey English that D.T. Suzuki uh, uses in this, his translations. Okay, and the last picture is uh, number 10, entering the city with bliss-bestowing hands. I always remember that line. That's the one line I could have quoted for you from all this uh, before I even started uh, doing this, uh, this video and re-studying them. 
So it goes. His thatched cottage gate is closed, and even the wisest know him not. No glimpses of his inner life are to be caught, for he goes on his own way without following the steps of the ancient sages. Carrying a gourd, which, according to uh, Suzuki, is a symbol of emptiness, shunyata, he goes out into the market leaning against a staff, and it says, No extra property he has, for he knows that the desire to possess is the curse of human life. That's uh, Suzuki's footnote. Uh, leaning on staff, he comes home. He is found in company with wine bibbers, is that bibbers or bibbers, uh, and butchers. He and they are all converted into Buddhas. So that's a nice thing, even the wine bibbers wine drinkers, I guess, and butchers are converted into Buddhas. And the poem goes, bare-chested and barefooted. I don't like to take my shirt off. Even when Zero Defects, everybody had their shirts off, I always kept mine on. But anyway, bare-chested and barefooted, he comes out into the marketplace. Daubed with mud and ashes, how broadly he smiles. There is no need for the miraculous power of the gods, for he touches and lo, the dead trees are in full bloom. The end. So that's that's how it goes, and that is the ten ox herding pictures. And as I said, it's more of a thing in the Rinzai school of Buddhism. So I don't know a whole lot about the the thing and the history and and what all. And we never made use of them. And Nishijima Roshi never taught the ten ox herding pictures or said, you know, here's how it's going to go and uh, remember these pictures and such like. It tends to be more of a Rinzai thing, but I still think it has some good stuff to say. And there you go. Make of it what you will. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to enjoy more pictures or if you want to help me buy more old books like this one, you can send a donation to the URL you're seeing on the screen below, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate that is hardcorezen.info slash donate there you will find links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts those are my only ways of making a living pretty much all the time I occasionally get a check for book royalties but it's never very much so I really appreciate those of you who help me out because you're keeping me in dog food and socks so I, I thank you for watching and we will see you next time have a good time all the time bye hey Ziggy you know what we need to do we need to do the 10 dog herding pictures. You want to do that sometime? We'll do the 10 Ziggy herding pictures. Hey, Zig. Want to do that? Maybe not. Okay. Bye.